All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are really excited to have Caroline uh, Nowry with us and Matt Illion. I'm going to open with a few remarks um, and then we will get into an interesting conversation and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, I'm Christine Mahoney. As many of you know me, I direct social entrepreneurship at the University of Virginia, which is the new home of the Virginia Impact Investing Forum. We help and support social entrepreneurs and impact investors expand their work to support our communities. And this work is more important than ever. Um, the Commonwealth and the country are facing a multiple layered uh, crisis. We have the COVID crisis, uh, which originally uh, was the driving idea behind this webinar. That has been layered with the economic crisis. And on top of that, we have the compounding effect of institutionalized racism, which is leading to worse health outcomes, economic outcomes, and judicial outcomes for our citizens of color. We are seeing the police and security forces attacking and murdering people of color with impunity. Um, and we are seeing that these entrenched systems of racism are finally being noticed and seen by some, but this is a crisis that has been constant. The COVID public health crisis has taken the lives of 1,620 of our residents in Virginia. It's sickened and affected over 50,000 additional citizens. Um, and we know that this health crisis is disproportionately affecting African-Americans who are being infected at a higher rate, are dying at a higher rate, and who are disproportionately caught in the web of mass incarceration, which is making them increasingly and incredibly vulnerable to infection. At the same time, we have 400,000 Virginians that have applied for unemployment. Um, and we know that due to racial income inequality gaps and wealth gaps that our citizens of color have less savings to draw on during this enduring and kind of stagnant economy. So we know that the coronavirus threatens our vulnerable communities immediately, but it also threatens their long-term health and well-being. And so today, Matt and Caroline are going to discuss a number of initiatives that are aimed at both the immediate economic uh, fallout of the crisis, as well as a number of initiatives that are aimed at working toward more, more long-term wealth building and economic equity. Current polling is showing that we need transformational change toward more equitable economic outcomes uh, if we're gonna preserve our economy. So to achieve that, we need to significantly scale up impact investing along with critical policy changes. So we are so pleased to have Caroline Nowry with us, who's the Vice President and Director of Community Investment at Virginia Community Capital, which is the first B Corp uh, bank in the nation. She's responsible for managing and cultivating relationships with strategic partners and investors who share a passion for advancing community development in Virginia. She oversees the important measurement, collection, and reporting of both social and financial returns to all VCC impact investors. And she's responsible for managing and overseeing third party evaluations to the US Department of Treasury and to B Lab. Prior to joining Virginia Community Capital, she served for five years as the director of the SBA Small Women's uh, Business Center in Richmond. We are also excited to have Matt Illion with us, who's an impact consultant with Vested In, which is an investment firm helping their clients align their capital with their values. He serves as an investment advisor for foundations, family offices, and individuals who seek greater impact with their capital. He has expertise in affordable housing, which we'll talk about today, um, ESG investing, shareholder activism, tax credit strategies, and venture philanthropy, which we'll probably also touch on today, also critically important in this space. And for the last two years, he's led the Virginia Impact Investing Forum as the executive director. Um, so Matt is going to kick us off today and provide a little bit of framing for our conversation. Um, and if there's any questions before we move into our deeper dive specifically on Virginia, you'll have an opportunity to ask a question in the, in the question box. Um, and then um, Matt will hand it over to Caroline, who's gonna talk about some important initiatives that Virginia Community Capital has been spearheading, and then turn it back again to Matt to discuss a couple more initiatives, and then we will go to Q&A. So with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Illion. Wonderful. 
Thank you, Christine, and, and thank you all for joining us. It's really great to um, spend this time together on this important topic. And Christine, thank you for the framing that you gave us. And, and really, I think these times um, demand us to consider how we're, um, how, we're, how we're investing all of our assets, all of our capitals in ways that achieve uh, achieve outcomes that will benefit all of society. And, um, and so that's what we want to talk about today. In particular, we want to focus on Virginia. Um, I've got a, uh, you know, I, I want to recognize too that impact investing means many things to many different people. And if, you know, if you've been in this ecosystem for any amount of time, you've, you've seen that. So I thought I'd share a, a spectrum slide or framework slide that I have found helpful just to, to help set the stage. This um, comes from the Omidyar network and, and essentially it's what the framework that they use and, and I share this, this with you um, and also as a framing for the conversation we're gonna have today. And, and the point of the spectrum is to say that we can achieve impact across the entire spectrum. And, and for a long time, you know, we've thought about impact purely on our philanthropic assets and you can see that on the right, the grant money, um, you know, that's, that's sort of where traditional impact has been done. But the whole impact investing movement has said, hey, we can also look at our investments and, and, and you know, attempt to achieve as much and maximize the community impact, the racial, the people, planet, profit, sort of um, triple bottom line. So um, if we look on the left-hand side of this continuum, that's the commercial side. And, and essentially that's where we're saying, hey, you can, um, you know, you can pursue impact investing in a way that's not um, giving up on your desire to achieve a market rate of return. And in fact, the Omidyar network would say 85% of their portfolio is in that market rate of return kind of commercial impact space. And, and that's absolutely essential. We're also gonna talk about this middle ground today uh, this B subcommercial, and I think I want to highlight this part because I think it's it really highlights the need to think about this uh, about why impact investing is so important. So I would say, you know, we will have commercial investments. You know, they they've existed uh, you know for eternity and will continue to. There will always be philanthropy. Um, but this middle ground subcommercial, they are noted that way because they either have um, a higher risk profile than maybe a traditional investor would want, or on the other hand, they might have a lower return. You know, so it's that risk return matrix just doesn't match up for the, the traditional investor. And this is the category where, but for impact capital, a lot of these ventures, a lot of these enterprises just wouldn't flourish. They wouldn't come to life. And so... Um, we're going to talk today and, and you'll hear about opportunities to invest and impact investing that's being done across this continuum. But I just want to stress as a framing, it's really about being intentional about your social and environmental impact across all of your investments across the entire continuum. And so with that, I want to turn over the conversation to Caroline Narrowy, who's going to share with us about her work at Virginia Community Capital. Thanks, Matt. Um, so first, I'm going to give a high level background of VCC. I'm going to talk about some of our um, impact numbers and projects that you'll see on the slide in front of you. Then I'm going to talk about our response, um, our first three responses to the um, pandemic. So VCC was founded in 2006 with a $15 million investment from then Governor Warner's administration. We now have over 400 million in assets under management. Our mission is to support housing and community development ventures, increase jobs, and build sustainable communities by offering flexible financial products and advisory services. Since we have a primary mission of promoting community development, our target market include projects that benefit low to moderate income people and communities across Virginia. So we have key focus areas, um, affordable housing, access to healthy foods, job creation through small business lending, clean energy, access to healthcare, and economic revitalization. 
Um, we're a unique structure of the most CDFIs and the fact that we have a CDFI loan fund that owns a for-profit CDFI bank. Both are certified by the Department of Treasury. These, being able to have both of these unique structures allows us to access capital that many other CDFIs can't, including grants, debt, deposits, and equity from socially motivated individuals and institutional investors. As of 2019, you'll see on the slide, we've achieved about 1.75 billion in total impact, which includes VCC lending, leveraged with other partners and sources. We've originated over 630 loans, and we've had significant social impact. Nearly 8,000 jobs created or retained, and over 28,000 in advisory services. And loans accessing food access and healthcare. Um, a couple of examples of loans that we have had are an affordable housing project in partnership with Better Housing Coalition. Market Square 3 is located in Chesterfield, and this development is for low-income seniors. Income restrictions apply as the development was built using low-income housing tax credits. The building offers community rooms, lounges, and the residents have access to Bermuda Health Care Center. Um, the market at 25th in Richmond is another example. Previously a food desert, this market serves a community that lacked access to fresh food. The, the facility also houses a pharmacy and a community room. So those are just two examples of projects. Um, next slide, please, Matt. One of our first responses to the pandemic was our early participation in the Paycheck Protection Program. And you'll see on the slide two examples of that. Also, when VCC Bank, we were already an SBA lender, and we mobilized, quickly mobilized um, about half of our team to re respond to this need. So we totaled over 300 loans with about $30 million. This retained an amazing number of over 3,500 jobs, which is just huge for our community. Um, some of the ones you'll see highlighted is that 38 were to nonprofits, 84 were women business owned, and 65 minority business owned. Two of the pictures that you'll see, one is Hope Pharmacy, which is actually located in the market at 25th. Um, Dr. Brown had got an SBA loan last year, and that helped her establish the business. When the PPP funding became available, she used it to um, retain five employees. And as part of her response to the COVID-19, Dr. Brown began producing hand sanitizer, which she's providing to first responders. The second picture that you see is the Virginia Beach CDC. Um, as we know, providing housing and support services is essential during the pandemic. The Virginia Beach Community Development Corporation helps to provide quality, affordable housing opportunities to low and moderate income people. A Paycheck Protection Program loan is covering payroll costs for the CDC's 26 employees so that they can keep serving the community. Another immediate action that we did was we offered a three-month deferment payment to any small businesses in our portfolio that were experiencing difficulties to the pandemic. A third response, which um, is pretty exciting, especially since the moratorium on evictions is going to end later this week, is we've worked with philanthropic support to provide a renter's relief program. We will give loan forgiveness for three months for affordable housing developers if, borrowers do, if these borrowers do not seek eviction during this time. And we all know that that's, it's gonna be a wave that's coming down from this, from everything that's going on. Um, so in essence, BCC provides capital or loans when clients may not be able to secure them through a traditional bank an investment from philanthropic, socially motivated individuals and additional partners help us do that. So, and we'll talk, we can talk about this later, but VCC has a number of ways to invest. Um, if you're a socially motivated investor and you want to make a deposit in VCC, it's completely FDIC insured. So you know that your deposit is going back into your community and the community that you care about. Um, a, you know, we have two other ways to invest. Um, one is a local impact opportunity note, and I think Matt's going to talk about notes a little bit later too, but that note is offered to accredited investors, and it can serve a geographic focus or a programmatic focus. 
Um, and lastly, we do offer equity, um, Class B common stock equity in the bank. And th those last two are just offered to accredited investors. So uh, I think Matt, you were gonna take questions later or, and then you were gonna cover a couple of other examples now. Yeah, that sounds great. And what I want to do actually is uh, we have a poll set up for the audience. And, and uh, so Millie, if you can share that poll. Uh, and what we really want to do is just get a sense of whether folks in the audience have made an impact investment before. We've given you um, the spectrum to kind of talk about impact investing. And Caroline has, um, you know, shared with you investing in VCC. And so if you take a minute and just uh, let us know if you've made an impact investment, we'll um, circle back to that, to this question in, in a few minutes and see where we're at with the audience. So while we're waiting on that, I'll give everybody a minute to respond. Um, first of all, I wanna say thank you to Caroline and to VCC, I mean, as uh, the largest CDFI in our region, VCC has just played a really vital leadership role across Virginia in uh, expanding the investment opportunities, the amount of capital that's going to really sort of high impact community development work, affordable housing, and everything Caroline has shared. Uh, I was also had some other, uh, you know, I think really exciting opportunities that are coming up in Virginia. The first one that I wanted to share is uh, uh, a new CDFI to the scene to Virginia is Virginia Food Shed Capital. And I've got a, uh, some images here of the work they do, but essentially this CDFI newly minted is promoting the local food economy. And the way they do that, I love the term that they use is they're leveraging what they call nurture capital. So we're, you know, nurturing the, the, the land and supporting the, the farmers and, uh, you know, local food economy workers across, uh, across Virginia. They do this through what, what they have a soil fund and they've uh, amassed a charitable account. People make charitable donations into their soil fund. And that allows them to give money to some of the farmers you see here at a 0% interest rate and it's repaid back in three to five years. So it goes directly to the farmers, it helps them you know, increase the productive capacity on their farms or connecting with um, you know, the farmer's markets. And they, the loans that they offer have a max in that soil loan of, of $10,000 and 79% um, of the loans they made over the last year and a half went to women and minorities. And 83% of those loans went to um, uh, people who would who'd be low income. They're also, Michael Riley shared with me, who's um, the head of, of this uh, Virginia Future Capital, that they, they are seeking to raise an additional $500,000 through a note, as Caroline mentioned, that would have a, a nominal rate of return of 2%. And this would be for accredited investors, but this would be allow them to invest along with private capital in larger projects. And they're seeing some bottlenecks in the local food economy that, you know, they think there's some people out there who can help with that. So when I talked to Michael about what's, the, what's been the impact of, you know, the COVID impact on the economy for these local farmers, he had some really interesting things to share. And, and maybe we might even get a chance to connect with him at the end of this. I think he's on the call. Um, he shared with me that uh, the winners have been the quote unquote protein producers. So not being a farmer myself, it just took me a few minutes to connect that, but yeah, that, you know, the cows and, and the pigs that we eat, that sort of thing, the, the meat or protein, um, you know, as COVID hit the industrial slaughterhouses, a, a lot of people became much more careful about where they were sourcing their meats from, they wanted a pasture raised and that sort of thing. So protein producers locally have done quite well. And also the growers, the, the fruits and vegetables growers who had strong CSAs and strong farmers markets uh, have, have performed quite well as again, sort of locally sourcing has stayed as important as ever. The folks who got really hurt was, was a quote unquote wholesale provider. So the folks who are 
producing for uh, restaurants, farm the table. They lost, you know, their customer base as well as Michael shared with me, there's a number of communities that just didn't have strong uh, farmers markets. And a lot of those uh, markets just haven't emerged back or didn't keep running uh, during the COVID response. And so, you know, those farmers have had to scramble to find new distribution um, techniques. So, uh, you know, I just want to highlight this group. They're doing some really important work to supply the food that we eat and connecting our, you know, sort of the people with our local farmers and the soil. And, uh, and they're, they're out there raising funds and uh, you can email and what we'll have actually at the end of this, a, um, contact sheet, which will give, you know, all the participants here, if you're interested in following up, a chance to, to follow up and learn more about the opportunities to either invest um, or, um, or sort of give in a charitable way. So the next group that I want to talk about is this affordable housing space. And uh, in, in my introduction, this is near and dear to my heart. In fact, I need to disclose that uh, the organization that I'm going to talk about, Urban Hope, is one that I was on the founding board of and, and helped build their financial model. But this group, uh, Urban Hope, for the last eight or nine years has been pro providing affordable housing for people in the east end of, of Richmond. And um, what makes them unique, you know, uh, affordable housing can mean lots of things. And they really target the affordable of the affordable housing. So they're in that 20 to 60% of AMI. And, um, you know, these are folks who are, uh, you know, really struggling and the support that they get from Urban Hope uh, to make sure that their rent is, you know, matches their income. And, and also they provide, you know, these money smart financial management classes to ensure that their clients are, are kind of progressing um, along. So the, um, they have also a note and they offer a two and a half percent return and, um, and you know, their minimum investment is $20,000, but they're, they're working with private capital to um, increase the amount of affordable housing that is provided and support that's provided. And, um, the other group that I wanted to mention, I didn't put there, I didn't really put information on this slide because it's not particularly Virginia focused, but there is a, um, a group called Enterprise Community Partners that has built a national affordable housing fund. That's more of a institutional class. And so um, it might work for a foundation, it might work for a family office, but it's to uh, help sustain affordable housing across the country. There's a lot of affordable housing that as the credits roll off, they often go back onto the market as you know, market rate. And so you have gentrification that follows. And the reason why I bring them up is they've done a, some intentional work to try and place some investments here in Virginia. And I know they've worked with some Virginia investors and um, are doing some really, really important work on that. The last category that I wanted to bring up, and then we'll turn it over to some uh, question and answer, is this opportunity zone capital. And we don't have enough time to get into all the details of how opportunity zones work, but um, maybe I'll just simply say that these are qualified census tracts that, that exhibit um, economic distress and that there are tax breaks for investing in businesses or real estate investments in these census tracts. And the two really exciting opportunities in Virginia that I want to make sure get noted, one is Opportunity Virginia. This is a uh, state-funded marketplace that's run by Locus. Uh, Locus is under the Virginia Community Capital. Again, another example of how Virginia Community Capital has seeded a lot of the impact investing work in our region. But what they do is on the marketplace, they allow um, folks who are putting deals or seeking capital put, to put their investment opportunities onto the marketplace. You can go there now. There, I think there are 33 different investment opportunities. You'll see one, um, an opportunity to invest in solar farms. You'll see the opportunity to invest in a uh, food co-op in Fredericksburg. 
And so, and in addition to a number of other, um, you know, just investments into, uh, into these zones. And they're really curating uh, these opportunity investments, opportunity zone investments to ensure um, that they are, they have a strong sort of social environmental impact. And, um, you know, that's important when we talk about opportunity zones because we've seen, and I'm sure you've heard in the news that sometimes this opportunity zone capital is going to just promote gentrification or something that maybe would have been considered to be commercial or done anyways. And, and it's hard to know sometimes why the tax breaks are being dispersed. And, and so I bring that up just to say that Opportunity Virginia and this marketplace helps curate that list. Um, we also noted before the call that there are deal, there are opportunities on deals that are going on that may not be on this marketplace, and so this doesn't necessarily a comprehensive list, but um, you know it'll give you a sense of ways to direct impact capital into Virginia projects. I also want to bring up, and I saw Megan uh, Moore from Blueprint Locals on the on the webinar. Um, they've launched they they launch opportunities on funds around the country. They've done one in Texas. They've done one in Baltimore. And they're looking to launch one uh, here in Virginia, which we're really excited about. And, um, you know, this would be a chance for investors to invest in a diversified portfolio of these Opportunity Zone investments. So they're looking for investments that create economic development um, in a just way, quality jobs, address housing, affordable housing shortages, or build critical community infrastructure. And in particular, they're focused on the communities in Richmond, Charlottesville, Central Virginia, Roanoke, and lastly, Hampton Roads. Um, I asked Megan for some examples of the types of investments that they've done in their other funds because they haven't launched the Virginia fund yet. And she shared with me that they, um, you know, an investment in Austin, Texas was a uh, creative office space that was, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, for the kind of a maker space. And, um, and then in Baltimore, they are the lead investor developer of the a redevelopment of the Baltimore Penn Station. So the Amtrak station there. So that kind of gives you just an idea of the, the types of investments that Blueprint Local is, is looking at investing in. And um, with that, I'm gonna pause before we go to, I turn it back to Christine. Millie, could you share the results of the uh, poll with us? Okay, yeah, so we've got 40% here who have made impact investments, 60% who have it. And um, I'll just say my hope is from this call today, when we do the poll again, we've given you some great opportunities to invest both at a smaller scale, larger scale. Um, I would love to see this webinar and see this as the beginning of, of generating more capital to, um, to impact. And with that, I'm gonna turn off my screen share. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, so we'd love to start taking some questions from the participants we have. Uh, we have one question queued up. Um, we've already heard about a number of examples that fall across that returns continuum that we talked about, right? We heard about opportunities to invest in VA food shed capital, which would be more on the venture philanthropy side. We heard about, as Caroline mentioned, there's an opportunity to invest in um, also concessionary um, opportunities, also with food shed capital with the 2% return would fall into that uh, sub-commercial or concessionary capital uh, framework. And then there's some of these opportunity deals that are on the, uh, the Opportunity Virginia platform, opportunities for um, new job development, but also great businesses that uh, would be able to achieve uh, market rate return as well as the preferential tax benefits of Opportunity Zone investing. Um, so before we start rolling in many, many questions, um, I will ask one question as the audience thinks about their additional questions, um, is just that do, to both maybe Caroline and Matt, are there additional kind of concrete deals that maybe you could, for those that are kind of new to the space um, that you think are exciting? So, you know, I'm based here in Charlottesville, Virginia, 
And we know that there's a creative CDFI here, a Piedmont Housing Alliance that is working on a major affordable housing redevelopment and looking for impact investors in their early childhood space. Um, we have a new African-American Community Development Corporation that's looking to develop a revolving loan fund to stabilize some of our African-American communities. Um, 4P Foods, I know, which is, I think, also in the, in the world of Blueprint Local, are looking at um, investments uh, to expand access to food and support farmers as well. So there's a lot of deals, you know, just in, in our small bubble of Charlottesville that maybe aren't on some of these platforms yet and aren't on radars across the Commonwealth. And I'm sure a number of the attendees, you know, have those ideas, in, you know, floating around in their heads for their neighborhoods, whether it's Northern Neck or Richmond or down in Danville. So maybe if each Matt and Caroline could talk about an example of an impact investing deal that they saw a range of types of capital get involved in that they thought was really exciting, um, just so people can start thinking about how they can use their assets to help us emerge from COVID uh, more equitable and more resilient. Well, I, and you know, what I have seen as a number, and I think it's just gonna grow a number of, um, loan funds being set up for small business, even the forgivable loan funds across the state. Typically, I think, you know, many of the foundations, community foundations are organizing these types of loan funds. Um, I'm not sure if it's just giving a grant or if it could be a 0% return, um, but I, I see it's really exciting. I've seen it in Richmond with a number of the foundations um, and our corporate foundations are stepping up. Um, we've talked to a number of them that have decided, Dominion being one of them, that have decided to create small business loan funds as well. So I think you'll see that activity in your chamber if you do research. I think you'll see it in the local community foundations. Um, I know down in Danville and the Harvest Foundation in Martinsville, they're having conversations about it too. So no matter where you are in the state, I think you'll you'll see more of that. I also think that um, this isn't an opportunity for investment, but I think there might be a statewide um, loan fund that's being set up soon as well. So just keeping your eyes out and doing your research, I think is really important, especially if you, if you care about the community that you're in. I mean, that's where you can get started. And there's so much going on in Charlottesville. We're, PHA is a great partner of ours. So I'm so excited to see what they're doing. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that, Christine, that it's often hard for individuals to get to know um, about some of these impact investing opportunities because typically when they're started, they, they're opened as, um, you know, to accredited investors and they can't advertise, uh, you know, for any terms on the website unless it's done in a kind of a private way. And so... Um, I, I think that to me just says all the more important that we're getting together in conversations like these and, and also in the work that, you know, uh, that you're doing and, you know, and, and this ecosystem mapping work so that we can start bringing like-minded folks, investors together so they can start sharing, you know, opportunities to co-invest because that, that's really what it takes. It, 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 you can't lift these things up with one or two investors typically it usually takes a number of foundations coming together or family offices or um, you know, individuals with means to help launch a fund if, and, and go through all the um, you know, bureaucracy of, of getting that launched. And so that's why I think you're gonna see the CDFIs are really leading in terms of what retail investors can invest in. And, um, and then we need to have conversations of, with folks so that we can lift up some of these institutional type investments as well. Great, thank you. Um, and I will just make a, um, a plug for what Matt mentioned. Uh, VIF and SC at UVA are working this summer on an ecosystem mapping of the Virginia impact investing ecosystem. So we're being very thorough and we're going through all the databases um, and all of the conferences, but if you are out there on the call and you have a family office or you have a foundation or you're an impact investor that has assets that's aimed at having a social and environmental impact um, and perhaps you're not yet on our radar, please do uh, reach out to us. We'll share um, a link uh, both in the chat and in a follow-up email 
Um, but we are trying to connect impact investors across the Commonwealth that do want to invest together. So that work is, is carrying on. So we have a, a couple questions. So I'll put these both, um, the first question I'll put to both maybe Matt and Caroline, they might have different perspectives on, on their, how they might answer this. As a young person in Charlottesville, how do I make an impact and think about investments when I don't have much expendable income yet? Yeah, I, I would, you know, I would, uh, I'll, I'll give Caroline a plug and BCC. I really think, you know, a, um, a CD or a savings account at BCC could be a great way to start. It's, it's, uh, Caroline, if you could share the minimums for someone who wanted to get start started, um, but I know it's, it's very low and it just puts your savings, um, you know, to work with a, an organization that's doing some great work. Yeah, I, I, um, I think you're right, Matt. I think that you'll, and, and the way that we treat our depositors is we share with them all of our, not only our financial impact, but it's equal to our social impact. So when we report out in our annual reports or when we provide reports um, to investors and we consider our depositors mission investors because we're not a consumer bank, we won't be your main bank branch. Um, but you can make a deposit with us through a money market account, a CD or a savers club, and they can, and you'll know it's supporting your community. We also have specific, um, we also have specific CDs where you can invest um, at a minimum of $250 for an 18 month CD for affordable housing, food access, and then clean energy, which we know is, you know, a, it's, it's a huge a huge need too. So um, I can connect with you on that offline. And I think they gave my, I think Christine put our contact information up there. So I'm happy to share that with you. I, I mean, it is hard when you're first, you know, getting started and you don't have a lot of liquid capital. I would say the other thing that you can do, this isn't maybe as much Virginia focused, but you can ask your employer if they'd add like a, a, a an ESG or a socially responsible um, investment strategy to your retirement plan. Um, you know, I think that's these, most, most retirement plans don't have them. I think maybe a third do. And, um, you know, it's just a simple thing. It takes, um, doesn't take a lot of time for that to get added. But if, if employees aren't asking for that, then it's, you know, that option is not going to be available. Okay, thank you. We have another important question, and I'll put it again to both of our panelists. How can we use impact investing to combat systemic racism? Um, and, and I will just throw out there, we, we have worked with and had some speakers from um, social enterprise incubators and investment funds that are particularly focused on racial equity, and I think that is an important piece um, when we're trying to measure everything um, and race is just one of many variables, uh, I think that isn't enough uh, to get where we need to be. And so if you look at some models in other states and other cities, uh, Propeller, which is an incubator down in New Orleans, which is really focused on, on, on racial equity in its support of, of businesses and business as a, a builder of wealth, I think that's important. Um, New Hill Development Corporation, who's a partner of ours, which is focused on African American home ownership. Again, home ownership as an important pathway to wealth building. Um, I think really active and proactive and authentic commitment to racial equity as a core mission is important. Um, ideas, Matt and Caroline, other examples that you're seeing either outside the state or uh, in the state? Matt, did you want to share some? Um, because I, you know, we're starting to evolve some of, we're entering into phase two of our response. Um, so we're having these conversations and we're doing this market assessment, especially knowing that businesses of color were, a, a lot of them were most affected by the um, turndown, the economic turndown. So I think we're evolving our response. You know, we're trying to listen and learn what the needs are. I see financial institutions reaching out to us because they invest with us for Community Reinvestment Act um, credit. And they're having specific asks. Could you do this? Could you to address some social justice issues, especially in communities of color? Um, 
So while we might not have some, uh, we might not be there yet. We're, we're doing our market research and we're trying to get there, but Matt might know of more outside of the state. Well, I, I was thinking, I mean, this is why I love the question. So thank you for asking it. And fundamentally, I think it's why impact investing and the, the, this, the fact that this conversation is being lifted up is so important because, you know, investing as usual, um, and, you know, sort of in the markets, business as usual is investing in the status quo. And so if we're going to simply look at returns and, you know, that's our only benchmark, which is how, um, how we have invested, you know, we, meaning um, America's wealth has been invested for centuries, um, then we're, we're going to get the status quo because we're just, we're simply investing in, in, in that. And so, um, when we're talking about impact investing, we're saying we're being intentional. And I would say that's not only about the, um, the outcomes of, of what, you know, where, what the money, what's being measured. I've also seen um, foundations and some other institutional cap, um, players who've started saying, hey, we want to be intentional about who's managing our money. And so how many women, how many uh, minorities I mean, uh, are, are in, the, in that leadership seat of deciding how our capital is being deployed? Uh, and so, you know, again, systemic racism, it's part of the maybe unbiased, unconscious bias, it's part of the system, it's the business as usual. It's, it's what we, you know, we've lived with these monuments. I'm here in Richmond, so I can say we've lived with these monuments for a hundred years without really sort of collectively acknowledging there's a problem here. And, um, and so I, I'm hopeful that, you know, as we're saying, we want to be intentional about the way our money is being invested, our wealth is being used, it's going to change. And, and that's my hope, it's my prayer. So um, again, I, I think it takes the collective efforts of all of us. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, one of the ways to achieve impact is to return financial security to low and moderate income workers that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. How are you working with businesses that you lend to or invest in to empower financial security in their workforce? Maybe Caroline, any? I know you do some work on um, financial resilience as well, right? Well, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. Um, so how, um, how are you working with the businesses that you lend to, to and that you invest in to empower the financial security of their workforces? So um, we first, when we opened up our PPP response, we did it for um, our clients first because we knew that the initial tranche was going to go away fast. Um, we heard from many of our clients, you know, even though we're not their traditional bank, that they, they were not being responded to by some of the other financial institutions. Um, mm -hmm. And we also opened up and did a number of educational series for nonprofits. We partnered with the Community Foundation in Greater Richmond to talk to the nonprofits about how they can access PPP loans because they weren't able to, they, they did, a lot of nonprofits don't take on debt. It's just not a traditional thing that they do. Um, we, you know, hosted outreach with a lot of the different chamber events as well. Um, and I think, you know, as far as resilience, we offer ongoing technical assistance to our borrowers. Um, we we'll talk to them about where they are. And like I said, you know, we, we designed like a, the three month deferment payment for small businesses when they first, when this first started. Um, so we're constantly evaluating our portfolio and the responses. Okay, wonderful. And, I, and I'd add to that, I know that a number of CDFIs and CDCs here in the Central Virginia region, especially those that are focusing on financial resilience through the power of home ownership, um, many of them have very robust financial literacy and financial resilience coaching. So that's you know Piedmont Housing Alliance, that's the Community Investment Collaborative, that's New Hill. So um, depending on where you are in the Commonwealth, uh, you can definitely check into your CDFIs and CDCs um, if you're kind of interested in for example, getting involved as a financial coach or a, a mentor. Um, that's always another way to get involved and support this work if you don't have assets your, of your own to invest. Um, I, I saw, Christine, that Michael Riley said he, he's on the call and, and would be available. I don't know if we can turn on his um, 
uh, microphone Definitely. if that's possible, but I'd love to hear his response too to how um, Virginia Food Check Capital is, um, you know, addressing the disparities and uh, supporting low and moderate income uh, employees and, and in entrepreneurs. That would be great. Let me just pull him up. Michael, is he on here? Michael Riley. Did we lose him? Oh, there he is. Talking permitted. So Michael, you're on. If you can unmute yourself, you should be able to share a bit about your experience um, with uh, those you have invested in. Sure. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Great. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, as, as a organization that works with local farms and food businesses, most of the um, businesses are low income and um, are in a position where they struggle to access capital through traditional means. So that's really the purpose of our organization to break down those barriers for the local food system. And there are, has been, has been mentioned, Matt has mentioned on this call, other organizations, including BCC and, and others around the state that are really working hard to create a more robust local food system. We are excited about the work we are doing um, with some of the smaller farmers at the lower level um, that is not being addressed by you know, other organizations. Um, and so, yeah, most of most of the the work that we have done has been uh, in that space and supporting farmers of color um, and uh, and again other other low income borrowers who don't have access to to capital. So, um, and ho hopefully that's that's addressing the question. Thanks, and and Michael, I just follow up. Um, how do you find the farmers that you work with? Are they reaching out to you? Or are you doing outreach to them? Is it a little of both? Yeah, it's a combination for sure. We do outreach quite a bit. Um, our, do myself and our, our board members and our staff are connected in with a lot of farmer organizations around the state. Um, I'm on the uh, Statewide Farmers Market Association and uh, VABF, which is the Biological Farming Association statewide. So we have a, a pretty extensive network that we tap into. And then we just, you know, through word of mouth and um, just connections, um, through our work, we are able to uh, develop a pretty, a pretty consistent pipeline. Thank you so much. Well, I think we are, um, do we have one more question out there in the audience? Any other? I saw two questions in the chat. I don't, there's a Q&A in a chat, but um, oh. one was on um, impact measurement and, um, and how we do that. And, and, um, and then there was another great comment as well from Sambo about who's in the in the room and the conversations when we're having about impact investing. Uh, oh, okay, I'll, shall I share Sambo's? Um, sorry about that. I didn't. I was following there only the Q and A. Um, this space of impact investing has few black people. Once I attended a VCC meeting and someone asked me what I was doing there, and I had a hard uh, and how I had heard about the meeting. Um, so can we maybe respond to, um, you will need to do some basic materials to ensure that people can change the way they think about this space. Um, how, is there any kind of responses to that in, in the diversity of the impact investing space in the conferences you're going to, the summits, any ideas on how the, the very space of impact investing is diversified and made more inclusive? Well, also, I would I would offer a chance to talk to him outline about that offline about that particular meeting if if you would like because I'd like to learn more about that experience. Um, but I I do feel that you know social justice and the DEI lens are going to be placed on high priority as we're moving forward as it should be under um, with everything that's happening and that people are, you know, realizing starting, you know, on a, on a more systemic level, understanding what has happened in the past and how we can move forward. My hope is that some of the um, impact investing mapping that you're doing, Christine, might pull out some more examples where we could show there's more diversity. Um, so, that, that would be my answer, but I would like, I'd love to talk to you offline too, if you'd like as well. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I would just um, add to that. I mean, on one hand, um, I, have, I have seen that the impact investing conferences and gatherings have been more diverse than the traditional all male white investing conferences that I have been to. 
Um, however, I, I want to acknowledge there's, you know, we have a long way to go in terms of, um, of achieving sort of the, the full diversity and expression. And, and I think really um, what, you know, part, part of this is not just who's in the room, it's also who are we listening to. So sometimes it's hard for when you have people of wealth in a room to sort of convince them that they need to listen to um, the people who are in the communities on the ground and, um, you know, experiencing sort of life. Um, and, and so how we do that, how we start to sort of change the conversation so that the people with the money and the people with the finance are, you know, and showing up in a way that is, um, is creating space and mutuality equality um, is, is really important and it takes training. I mean, I, I don't think um, that anyone who's grown up uh, with, you know, sort of the advantages of, um, uh, you know, of wealth or sort of being majority culture can just show up into another culture, another place that's not their own and, and, and do it, um, you know, without some some training without really thinking hard about how do I start to listen in a different way, show up in a different way. And so, you know, I, I, I appreciate the comment because it's calling out that we haven't arrived for sure. And, and that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to, um, to ensure that um, we're achieving the best outcomes, the, the deepest impact. And I'd add to that, um, I think it's also, it's not just about diversifying who is at these gatherings and convenings and at the table, because it's also important that the very um, asset management teams are also diverse. And so I was out at the social capital conference um, in San Francisco, and there's a number of leading impact investing funds that are being very intentional about diversifying their teams, um, about wealth holders uh, mentoring and partnering um, with with people of color and having more diverse teams and so I think that that is a really important step as well um, so that you know money the money in the room is um, be, how it's being deployed and how it's, that's being decided is also um, being determined by diverse voices do we have another question in the Q&A or in the panel there was that question on impact measurement and how that's being done. That's, and, a, that's a great question. Um, do we want to, I don't know if Matt wants to talk about that for, for any of the clients that Matt works with and then maybe Caroline, how VCC has looked at impact and measuring social impact. Sure, uh, I, would, I would say the more local you're doing your impact investing or you're, you're, you know, you're investing, uh, I think the less pertinent sometimes that question becomes and um, you know for example if if someone's investing in a restaurant in a food desert in their neighborhood or a, or a grocery store sorry um, you know you know there there's impact there and um, and I would say the same is you know is true for lots of, of different investments I think it becomes more important as you think more institutionally or you're less connected to um, those investments. So I, I don't want to downplay measurement. It's, a, it's absolutely important that we start um, getting some hard data on what the impact is. I also know that sometimes it's hard. Um, there's been a lot of energy spent. And in fact, this is one of the you know, key initiatives of the Global Impact Investing Network, the GIN, is to start to um, come up with metrics that we can all agree on. Uh, and yet, you know, when you're moving beyond the balance sheet, beyond the financial numbers, um, that can be really, that can be a big challenge. And so for a lot of my clients, you know, I've honestly encouraged them not to think too hard about it and essentially say, hey, if it's, you'll know if it's impact um, on the local deals, but if it's an institutional type investment, then you expect that you're not connected to, you expect them to report on um, you know, the social and environmental impact in a database way. And, you know, so that's my initial uh, thought, but I, I'd love to hear Caroline's response as well. So we've been um, 
we've been trying to evolve from measuring outputs like I had on the slides, the outputs of just, you know, the businesses and where they were located and trying to take it up to a different level. Um, it's something that's in our strategic plan and work right now. We have um, an impact team that is working on that framework. Um, we go back annually to our borrowers and clients and see where they are, what, they, what they've done, jobs created, but also annual increases in annual revenue, um, additional opportunities for contracting. Um, so while we're doing it really right now, it's on an output level, we are trying to explore how we can get to the outcome level. Like we know that this grocery store was in this community and, and how many people had a greater access to food that they didn't have without having to travel some, you know, a, a ridiculous amount of time away. Or um, if a job created this many, or if a business created this many jobs, what were the demographics of the people who were employed and, and things like that. So while we do, you know, we, we show outputs right now, we're trying to move to the outcome phase as well. All right, thank you both. Well, I think we are wrapping up now. Um, if anyone wants to learn more, um, we will, as we shared it in the chat, and we'll send a follow-up email. Um, there's a number of opportunities and ways for you to get involved um, from volunteer time and the smallest um, donation uh, to, or investment or um, new account with VCC to, to major and large uh, equity investments. And so there's lots of ways to get involved in in ensuring that Virginia emerges from the COVID and economic crisis a more, a more equitable place. So with that, if anybody has any follow-up questions, do feel free to reach out to us. Um, and thank you all so much for in, uh, joining us for this important conversation. And thank you so much to Matt and to Caroline for taking the time today. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you.